Registration is open for our annual one-day mission trip that will take place on October the 5th. We will begin the day at Jacksonville High School, then disperse throughout Jacksonville, Sherwood, North Little Rock, Maumel, Cabot, and the surrounding area. We will saturate this region with various ministries, each with the focus of sharing the good news of Jesus and seeing people saved. Annually, one day is the largest multi-generational gathering of Arkansas Baptist. On this day, churches of all sizes from all kinds of different communities come together to make a kingdom impact. It's amazing to watch families serve together and also see strangers become friends as they share a common desire to see people saved at a ministry site. One day is a great reminder of the impact of cooperative missions and the fact that we can do more together. Speaking of impact, the last 13 years of One Day has resulted in at least 1,150 professions of faith. This means that over the five hours of ministry at One Day, an Arkansas Baptist like yourself is leading someone to Christ about every three minutes. I pray that you will join us to see life's change in Central Arkansas on October the 5th. excited about all the things that God has done in the last couple of years as it relates to missions. This is the second year in a row that after our Kansas City trip a couple weeks ago, we had taken five separate mission trips as a church, which is, for a church like this is awesome. Really excited. But another thing the state convention offers is the one day experience, and Nick has been a part of that. I don't know if you come in and say something about it, because you know more about this than I do. But um, Nick is, has been a part of this for a long time between our church and his parents' church or whatever. Um, you gave me details, but I told you if you remind me, you didn't remind me, so you get to tell the, the details. <laughs> okay, so you can still sign up. That's a thing, so don't feel like it's too late. It is this Saturday. Uh, we'll be leaving from here about 6.30. We'll take one of the church vans. You don't have to drive yourself or anything like that. I will drive you. Sorry if that scares you. Uh, <laughs> but I will drive you. Uh, there's tons of different ministry opportunities. There's block parties, no cell yard sales. Uh, if they have a lake or anything in the area, a lot of times they'll do kids' fishing derbies. Uh, they've got dental work, uh, prayer walking, basically anything you can think of. Uh, they've probably got a ministry for that. Uh, we'll get there. We'll uh, meet up with everybody in the state that comes for the uh, morning. Then we'll disperse to different sites throughout that area. Uh, we'll finish up. It's usually about 3.30, 4 o'clock we finish up, so you'll be home in time for dinner. Uh, but if you want to uh, go or anything, or if you've already signed up, uh, we're going to do a short meeting in the choir room uh, after the service, just so I can kind of get a head count, figure out who all is going, uh, and answer any other questions you guys might have. Your daughters. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so if you have any questions, talk to him. It's a great experience. We did it in Russellville a few years ago. Um, we've taken people for several years in a row. There's, If you're interested in anything that could remotely be missions, one day pretty much offers just about anything um, opportunity-wise. There's something for you. So it's $15, right? Yeah. $15. Um, there's, a, there's an info thing, I think, on the bulletin board out there, but you can talk to Nick and get any details, specifics about it. It is this coming Saturday, so it's only a few days away, but it's not too late to be a part of it, and it would be a great thing to be a part of if you're interested in something like that. So, all right, the call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 130. Let's stand as we read. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful
Brian's kids um, fell out of a hammock that broke, it fell out of a tree several feet, um, and has some back issues and, and stuff like that. And now she's 19. Um, so please pray for, for her. She's in college right now and just very sore from, from that. So pray for Kate. Um, Psalm 1 is, is where our scripture comes from this morning. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked. Amen. As we pray, um, I'm going to give you some some things to pray for, some things to pray through. So let's go ahead and pray. Thank the Lord for the blessing and gift of his word. That scripture talks about rooting ourselves and, and it's ultimately about rooting ourselves in the word of God. Thank the Lord for the blessing and gift of his word. Ask for a greater love and desire for aside to read and pray over his word. Pray for God's strength to grow in you through knowledge. Pray for God to make his paths known to you through scripture. And pray that you have the chance to share his word with others this week. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you give us guidance. We thank you that you have given us a map. Book. You've given us instruction. You've given us something to root our, our lives in. And God, I pray that we would treasure that. I pray that we would seek knowledge of you through that, that we would listen to what you have to say through your word, that we would read it, that we would hold fast to it. I thank you that you've given us that. I thank you that you don't leave us blindly. Thank you for giving us your word to speak to us. Help us to have a desire to spend time with you. Help us to have a desire to know you on a greater level, to know your word on a greater level. Help us to, to take what we read, to take what we hear, to take what we learn and apply it and to have strength as we go through the week to live the life that you have for us, the life that you've given us in and through your word. God, make, make our paths known, make your paths known through scripture. Give us a hunger and desire for you and for knowledge of your word and to share that with others as well, God. If we have the hope, the living hope that we just sang about, why wouldn't we want others to have it as well? So give us a desire to know you more. Give us a desire to help others know you more. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to study and to read it, to know it and apply it. Help us to do that as we go through this week. In Jesus' name. Please bless the woman who have First Corinthians, starting at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent. I will frustrate. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews 
and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who, whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Amen.
Thank you, worship team. One of the things that uh, I think we've all dealt with the last few years is rising costs for everything, right? Groceries, gas, everything, right? So I read a story this week of a lady who went to the movie theater. And I haven't been to the movies very much in a long time, but I know movie prices have gone up as well. And she asked how much for a movie ticket. And the guy said $15. And she said, how much for a children's ticket? And he said, still $15. And she goes, what? Usually they give us a discount. Even the airlines give us a discount when there's a child. And the ticket counter guy said, well, ma'am, feel free to put your child on an airplane, fly him off somewhere, come back and, and enjoy the movie because you'll enjoy it a lot more without him here, probably. I don't know if I like that solution or not, but I just thought it was funny. I also read this week, this is a dad joke, so I'm going to get booed for this one probably, but you know what you become if you clean a vacuum cleaner? A vacuum cleaner, yeah. <clears throat> yes, I'll be here all week. Um, <laughs> I hope you guys are doing well this morning. Uh, the weather's been great. I was, had a conversation with a friend earlier today about just how awesome the weather has been lately. Um, you've heard Brett talk about, each week a little bit, talk about um, church league softball. We have a church league softball team for the first time, I think since 2008 or nine, somewhere in there. Um, in fact, I'm not going to undo my sleeve, but right here, I have a scar from the next to last time I played church league softball. Um, back in 2007, we were playing, and I was running out an infield hit. I was safe, by the way, which is the most important part of the story. Um, <laughs> I was running out an infield hit, and the guy from the other team was standing on the base. If you know anything about baseball or softball, first baseman is not supposed to be standing on the base. They're supposed to be touching it, but they're not supposed to be right on it. Big dude. I mean, he was probably 80 pounds heavier than me. I don't know if I broke my arm when I ran into him or if I broke my arm when I hit the ground after running into him. But I broke my arm when we played in 2007, I think it was. And I think we played one more year after that, and then we haven't had a team since then. We are not very good. I'm just going to tell you guys that up front. But it's a lot of fun. Like, we've had great crowds. We've had great support from the, from the church. Like, our stands are full every week, which has been awesome. And it's been terrific for a bunch of guys who don't necessarily all know each other and aren't necessarily in the same context, even at church, to get together and play softball. It's, it's just been a win, I think, for the church and for men of the church and stuff like that. I am, now Ernie's played a little bit, but Ernie hasn't played a whole lot. I'm the second oldest person on the team next to Brett as far as people who are playing consistently right now. And that's a weird thing for me because 15 years ago, I was not that. <laughs> 15 years ago, I was 34 and I still thought I was a cool youth pastor who was very athletic. Okay, I didn't think I was cool, but I was still very athletic and in pretty good shape back then. I'm not that anymore, although I've gotten better over the last couple of years since my health scare. But it's been so much fun to get back out there and just to, to see if I can do it. And I feel like I'm playing pretty well and, and we're having a lot of fun with it. And it's just fun to see the guys get together. So I say all that to give a little promo because we have a doubleheader tomorrow night. So if you're interested in coming and laughing, I mean, coming and enjoying a bunch of guys playing softball together, uh, 6.30 and 7.30 tomorrow night at Pleasant View. Uh, we play two teams we've already played and we lost bad. But um, again, it's a lot of fun. So if you're interested in, in that, come out tomorrow night and, and watch and have some fun with that. This morning, we're going to be in John chapter 4. And I'm not going to read all of 4 through 42, but that's the context for it. I'll, I'll read a lot of it in just a minute. But before I get into that, as you're turning there, if you haven't already, one summer, a father and son were out walking in northern England. They were in a farmer's field going for a walk in northern England. And the son had a metal detector, just kind of played around with it and that kind of thing. And, and at one point, the metal detector suddenly went off. And they dug where the metal detector went off. Greg will appreciate this. We just had a conversation about all his gimmicky things that he's been buying and trying to sell now. Um, they dug where the metal detector went off, and they dug up a metal bowl that it turns out was over 1,000 years old, had been buried by Vikings with over 600 gold and silver coins in it. Think about that. They set out on a routine thing that day. They set out just walking as a father and son. And they encountered something completely unexpected in the middle of an everyday activity. This morning, we're going to look at a lady who had something similar happen to her. She found something completely unexpected in the middle of an everyday normal activity going to fetch water 
from a well. So let's read from John chapter 4. And actually, I'm going to back up to verse 3. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would, he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, I perceive, sir, that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place Uh, where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with the woman, but no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. And I'm going to skip down to verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days. Many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. God, open our eyes this morning to show us that what this woman encountered in Jesus and the the way that her life changed because of that, that ordinary task, is something we can experience as well, that we can encounter you like this, and we can take that encounter and share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk about three things that happened in this story, three things that Jesus does in this encounter, th- three things that Jesus does in the story. And the first one is this. Jesus eliminates the barriers. If you're taking notes, that's number one. Jesus eliminates the barriers. There are all kinds of barriers to this encounter even happen. And in our lives, there's all kinds of, of barriers to us encountering Jesus or to other people encountering Jesus. It might be race. It might be gender. It might be past background. All of those are things that happened in this story. But here we find Jesus in an area that the Jews hated. Samaria. Dealing with a woman the Jews and even other Samaritans probably would have avoided. Woman from Samaria with a shady past comes to the well in the heat of the day. Noon. Not a normal time to come. Very hot time. That kind of stuff. She's probably likely expecting to encounter nobody. She's coming at that time hoping nobody's there, hoping she won't be scorned, hoping she won't be shamed by other people who are there. She has multiple strikes against her. A good Jewish man would have had nothing to do with her. In this culture, women were not respected. They were not spoken to in public. They weren't valued. So there's strike number one. She's a woman. Strike number two, she's a Samaritan. Samaritans are the despised lesser children of the Jewish race. Immoral, ethnically polluted, religiously confused. They're a result of Assyrians taking Jewish people in the northern kingdom into captivity and settling down with them. They're mixed race. They're taboo to good Jewish people. In fact, as far back as Nehemiah and Ezra's days, the Samaritans were told they were not welcome in helping rebuild the wall because of these things, or rebuild the temple because of these things. Intermarrying, fighting with Jewish brothers, all those kinds of things were unforgivable. Strict Jews would not even go through Samaria as they were going 
from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, they would take a long circuitous route. Like how many of you guys, when you go somewhere, you put it in your GPS or whatever you do, and you look for the quickest route, right? Unless it's tolls or something like that. That might be the one thing that you try to avoid, right? They would take this long, circuitous route around Samaria, crossing the Jordan River in the east to get from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north. But not Jesus, because here's what it says, if you didn't catch this, in verse 4. No, not verse 4. Let's see. Yeah, verse 4. And he had to pass through Samaria. Don't miss that wording. He had to pass through Samaria. Was it the only way to get where he was going? No. Did most people take that route? No. But he set aside the social customs because a person's eternity was at stake. This is a divine appointment. This is a divine encounter. He had to go through Samaria. Jewish people were so proud of their bloodline, so proud of their genealogies, they despised Samaritans. In fact, in verse 9, it says, For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Or... In the, in the New Living Translation, it says, the woman was surprised for Jesus refused to have, or for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. Samaritan was like a cuss word to devout Jews. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. So she thinks it's extraordinary that Jesus even speaks to her, that he would take the time to do that. So there's strike number two. And strike number three is this. To say the least, she's rough around the edges, right? How many times has she already been married? Five. I mean, especially in that culture, that's a big deal. And she's shacking up with somebody she's not married to at the time. All these strikes against her would have kept the average person from speaking to her. Would have kept the average person from wanting to do to have anything to do with her, from wanting to deal with her at all. But thankfully, Jesus is not average. Jesus is not the average person. Jesus is not the person who says, well, we've got to do it this specific way because blah, 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 blah. Jesus wanted to have something to do with her. Why? I think it, at, at the very basic level, it boils down to this. He saw her. I don't mean his eyes saw her like I see Craig right now. He saw her in the sense of he valued her. He saw who she could be. He saw worth in her. And there are people all around us all the time that that's what they want. They just want to be seen. I have conversations with students about that. In school, in sports, in different things that they're in, they just want to be seen. They just want to know that people see them. He saw her. He valued her. He loved her. He saw her need. And that's true of Jesus throughout his time on earth. He consistently sees the people that other people don't the leper, the sick, the prostitute, the woman caught in adultery, the nobody, the misfit, the sinner, the servant, the blind, the lame, the thief on the cross. He sees and values people that other people want nothing to do with. He sees and values people who, get this, have very little to offer back to him. And sometimes the way we treat people is like, I, I have room for you if, if you can give back to me. I have room for you if I can get something in return from you. There's a song by a band called Pawn Shop Kings called Love Like Jesus. And in the chorus it says, love the forgotten ones, love the friendless, love the children. I want to love like Jesus. And that's how Jesus is consistently in the Gospels. He loves and cares for them. And he'll do the same for us. If we ever doubt his love for us, just look at the people that he was around. Look at the people that he interacted with. Look at who he spent time with. He loved and cared for them, and he'll do the same for us. He didn't do anything immoral. He wouldn't do anything immoral or against God's standards or whatever, but you know what he did? He consistently flouted nonsensical customs and overly religious, overly legalistic religious traditions. He didn't have room for that. He broke with culture and tradition he put aside the reasons not to interact with her. He put aside the barriers created by man to reach her. And it says, and I skipped a lot of this part, but I did read a little bit of it in verse 27. 
his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with the woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? They come back and they go, doo, 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 doo. what's Jesus doing? Why is he doing this? Peter, what do you think he's doing? But none of them is brave enough to ask him. They didn't particularly like it, probably because they're thinking, here's the way we're supposed to do things. His own disciples were surprised to see him talking to them. And in this encounter, he shows how he values people. He sees them. He sees their need for him. And the question for us is, are we willing to do the same? Are we willing to get outside of our people? To get outside of the desire to just be around those who fit into our box or who fit into our little club or our little idea of how things are supposed to be? To quit judging who deserves it and who doesn't because here's the reality None of us deserves it. None of us deserves God's love. None of us deserves what Jesus did. None of us deserves the grace that is offered to us. So quit judging who deserves it and who doesn't because none of us does. We're all saved by grace alone. We're all given hope because of that grace. Not anything that we do. And the Bible says that, that grace is offered to all. It's available to all, no matter their past. I'll give you one warning here before I move to point number two. Once we really grasp this, once we really get this, once we really apply to this, apply this, it's going to be messy. It'll be messy. But it's a beautiful mess. Because it's Jesus. And it's the way of Jesus. So he eliminates the barriers. The second thing, Jesus speaks truth. Jesus speaks truth. I hadn't thought of this until this morning, but most of the time when I have conversations, okay, let me, let me back up and say this. I used to make fun of my dad because um, music always came to his mind with certain things or pop culture references or whatever, and then I became that, but times 10 probably. <laughs> like I have way more musical references and way more pop culture references than my dad probably ever did. I can't say something about Jesus Speaks Truth without thinking of the movie A Few Good Men. And in the climatic scene in that movie, Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise are going back and forth. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to answers. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. And sometimes that's how we are with Jesus. We say we want the truth, but we can't handle the truth. The woman keeps trying to detour. The woman keeps trying to distract Jesus. The woman keeps trying to use anything and everything to pull away from the heart of what he's trying to teach her and show her here. He's, she's deflecting. She's talking about prophets and baptism and worship styles and worship places and all this kind of stuff. She's saying to him, don't you know the rules? We don't even talk to each other, much less share cups. He refuses to be distracted. He refuses to be sidetracked. She clearly didn't know who she had encountered. She clearly didn't know how much he could change her, and that he could provide her with what she really needed, that he could provide her the living water that she desired that would never cause her to never thirst again. Jesus is not just some random guy that showed up that day. Jesus is a divine appointment for her. Ordained by God to meet her and give her opportunity to experience what she really needed. And so what he did was he spoke truth. She had to understand her great, need, her great need and the bad news about her life to get to the value of the good news. We talk about it in evangelism training all the time. Gospel means good news, but to get to the good news, where do we have to start? With the bad news. All of sin, right? And Jesus speaks truth to her. He calls out her sin. He tells her what? First, bring your husband. Knowing what we know, that's kind of a funny statement from Jesus, I think. And he knew she didn't have one. He says, bring your husband first. And then he acknowledges that he knew that, but he also knew that she had five previous ones and was not even married to the person she's with at that point. She's an immoral woman. She's looking for love in all the wrong places. Again, that pops a song into mind, the old Johnny Lee song, or the Saturday Night Live thing where Eddie Murphy said, look in Penub in all the wrong places. Um... <laughs> She's looking for love in all the wrong places. She's 
looking for love in relationships. And Jesus speaks to that. He speaks to her greater need for living water. She thinks she's okay until Jesus confronts her with the truth, calling on her to face up to her sin, calling on her to experience life change, to turn from her sin, to turn from the lifestyle that she's in. He starts with sin and how it breaks the covenant with God and how we have to deal with that because it separates us from God and we can't know him until we deal with the sin first. We have to own up to our sin. We can't just sweep it under the rug. We can't just pretend it's not problematic. We can't just pretend that we can move on from it and we'll be okay. John Bunyan called conversion wounding work. And what he means by that is this. It takes a breaking of hearts and a wounding to bring healing and safety. That's what confronting our sin does. It's wounding work. 1 John 1, verse 8 and 9 says this, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we're lying. And Jesus confronts her with the truth. She's going through the motions of life, and Jesus comes to her and shows her what she really needs. He shows her there's more than just life as she sees it. He shows her that it's more than just worship styles. It's more than just religion. It's more than rituals. It's more than all these things that she's trying to talk to him about. There's eternal life. There's something more. There's something she could have and experience right then and there. She doesn't have to go to the right place for it. She doesn't have to go to the right temple or whatever she's trying to tell him, we worship here and you worship there and all that kind of stuff. She can experience it right then and there, not just at a physical temple at a specific city or a specific location. She can experience right there. He neither condones or condemns her lifestyle. He merely states the truth and allows it to stand on its own without condemning her, shaming her, or exploiting her sinfulness. And he says, I am the Messiah. I am the one you're looking for. He speaks truth. And the last thing is this. Jesus transforms lives. Jesus transforms lives. This woman is searching for happiness in all kinds of wrong places. She's looking for meaning and purpose and thirsting for things that are not going to leave her satisfied. They're going to leave her empty. We cannot earn happiness. We cannot earn fulfillment. We cannot earn salvation through our own efforts, through anything that we chase after, anything that we seek after, yet we keep doing that. Despite the fact that, by the way, there's a book in the Bible that the first few chapters deal with that exact issue, the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, the wisest man, searches for meaning in wisdom, self-indulgence, popularity, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Okay, maybe not rock and roll. Um, the arts, all the different things. He goes through all these different things, and at the end of each section, what does he say? It's vanity. It's chasing after the wind. It's hollow. It's meaningless. Please hear this if you don't hear anything else that I say this morning. None of those things will satisfy. It's chasing after the wind. You can't catch it. You can't grasp it. You can't grab hold of it. We can't earn it in our own efforts through anything we chase after. And the book of Ecclesiastes makes that so clear. We're sinners in need of rescue. We're dead. We're estranged. We're sick. We're enslaved. And he appeals to her biggest need. If you see me in my office, if you see me walking around, more often than not, I have a water bottle of some type like this, partially because over the years, I just have developed a dry throat or whatever. So when I grabbed this water bottle this morning, I knew that when I drank it, I would be satisfied. And I'd be satisfied for the rest of my life, right? What? It's, it's, it's water. It satisfies me, right? No, not long-term, right? For a while, yes. Softball games tomorrow night, I'll probably go through a lot of water. Two games. But it's, it's not going to satisfy me forever. And Jesus talked about living water that would satisfy forever. And she didn't fully understand it at first, but he appeals to this need. He appeals to the spiritual need, the need for new life. Here's the thing that I realize, and I've taught on this story in a youth group, and I've preached on it before and so forth. The solution this woman needed was found in a man. 
It's not in the way she thought it was. She thought it was through relationship. She thought it was through marriage. She, she thought it was through sex. She thought it was through all these things. Not in the way she thought or the person that she thought. It was Jesus himself. I am the Messiah. I, who you were talking to, am he. He reveals to her that he's what she's looking for. He confronts her with the truth of who he is. He's the answer to the problem she faces because of sin, that we all face because of our sin. Jesus is the solution for her that day, and he's the solution for us today. She had to understand that she was a sinner. She had to understand that he was the answer. And when she found him, when she grasped that, when she understood that, it changes everything. He says in verse 26, I who speak to you am he. The disciples came back, blah, blah, blah. The woman left her water jar, went into town, and said to the people, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? What did she come to the well for that day? What did she leave at the well when she went to tell people about Jesus? What she came for, she left it there. The very reason she came didn't matter as much anymore. She found something better. She found something greater. And she went to find and tell others. And by the way, if you think back to what I said a little while ago, she came in the middle of the day, right? She came at noon, probably trying to avoid people, their scorn, their shame, etc. She meets Jesus, leaves her water behind, goes to, oh, tell people. Probably those same people. Probably those people that she had tried to avoid that day because of her shame. She came to the well an outcast, a nobody, expecting just to get the water and not hoping to see anybody. And instead she found Jesus. She encountered Jesus and it changed everything for her. This day was different. Jesus had intentionally made the decision to go through Samaria, which most Jews never did, for this woman. She was the primary reason he had to go through Samaria. He tells her he's the Messiah. He offers her life, living water, new life, salvation. She meets Jesus, and she walks away changed. And because he changes her, she's like a fire hydrant gushing out. She can't wait to tell other people. She can't keep her excitement contained. She has no seminary education. She has no wholesome life to point to. She has no religious background. She knows little theology to explain it all. But what does she do? She knows that she experienced something that she wants other people to experience. And so this woman with a scandalous past becomes one of the early evangelists and goes and tells people about Jesus, what she's experienced, what she's encountered. And because of her, it says, they went out of the town and were coming to him. Verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. And then it says, so when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. He stayed there two days and many more believed. Because of the scandalous woman, because of her encounter with Jesus, because she went and told, because of her changed life, because they knew who she was, they knew what her life had been, but they saw something different in her. They heard something different in her. Her testimony was enough for some to believe, for others it was enough to want to hear more, and after two days of teaching with Jesus, it says many more believed. There was a bunch of people whose lives were changed because of this encounter at the well. Not just her. Her, yes, but then she did what we're supposed to be doing anyway if our lives are changed. And she went and told. They knew what she used to be, and they knew what she had become. And they came to Jesus, and they were changed. He eliminated the barriers, he spoke truth, and he transformed her life and a lot of other lives. I'm going to ask Craig to come up here. We're going to close this morning. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes and listen as we wrap up.
The message of Christianity is not a bumper sticker slogan about doing good things and becoming a better person. It's a message of forgiveness and reconciliation. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God can forgive you like this woman. You're not beyond the reach of God. Jesus will push through whatever barriers exist to get through to you. He'll be your divine appointment. Nothing else will satisfy like him. Everything else will leave you empty. He's the living water that fills the void that nothing else can. You won't find peace anywhere else. So this morning, that's the first part of the invitation. If you need that experience, that encounter with Jesus, let today be that day for you. When we find that peace, though, those who would say that they already have, we have to offer it to others. We must share it with them so they can experience it, so they can experience him as well. We can't let our biases hold us back. We can't let mundane details of life hold us back from sharing. We can't allow the promise of tomorrow to keep us from sharing. We can't procrastinate. The joy of the Lord, the awe of his transforming power compels us first to a life-changing decision and second compels us to heed the call to tell others so they can experience what's changed us. She encountered Jesus that day. She didn't expect it. He changed her life. She became a different person. She wanted others to know the same thing. She wanted others to be able to experience what she had experienced. Do we? Have we experienced that first and foremost? And if you haven't, man, let today be that day. And if you have, we're compelled to help others find him as well. A lot of lives were changed because her life was changed. Same thing can happen for us. Same thing should happen through us. God, we thank you for stories like this, of people who encounter Jesus and their lives are changed. God, most people in this room this morning would say that they've encountered Jesus, would say that their lives have been changed. God, help us to truly live that. Help us to truly show that. Help us to, if if that's happened to us, to have the heart, to have the desire to let others experience that too. God, why wouldn't we want others to know that? We're compelled to a life-changing decision when we encounter Jesus. And that compels us to the call to tell others, to share with them so they can experience Jesus as well. God, this morning, move in our hearts, challenge us, compel us to a life-changing decision with you if that's what needs to happen. And if that has happened, compel us to a deeper desire, a deeper longing to know, to to help others know you, to help others come alongside us and experience what we've experienced. God, help us not to be unable to do that. Help us to be bound to do that. Help us to be compelled to where we literally have to do that because of the difference you make in us. Thank you for this time today. God, if there's anyone in this room who needs to come to know you as Lord and Savior, let that happen today. God, for the rest of us, challenge us, move us to be changed by Jesus in such a way that we're compelled to tell others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we worship. If you need to come to the altars to pray, you're open. If you need to come talk, I'd be glad to talk to you. If you need to make a decision of some type, this is your time to do that before you leave this week.
Capitals were closing on Angela's mom's house and then enjoying a little bit of free time. They went to the Razorback game yesterday and to the Texas State Fair, I think. And, um, so uh, that's where they are. But they'll be back for the fellowship tonight, which is a big, important thing that I need to remember to mention. Tonight is our annual ice cream social, 5 o'clock in the backyard over here. Uh, homemade, store-bought, whatever, bring ice cream. And we're going to get fat on ice cream tonight, I guess. Um, there will be games and volleyball and just a, no, no agenda, just a big time to hang out and enjoy each other and, and have a lot of fun together and stuff like that. So 5 o'clock back there Fellowship. tonight. Fellowship. Fellowship, yes. Two or more fellows in the same show. Um, <laughs> you guys never heard that? Um, there is a ladies' Bible study called Encountering God by Kelly Minter. Dania is leading that. Today is the last day to sign up. I think there's a sign-up uh, sheet on the, on the bulletin board over there if you're interested in that. I know there's a lot of names on there as well, so that's exciting. Um, I mentioned the softball games, 6.30 and 7.30 tomorrow night. I told you that I was one of the oldest people on the team. My legs have felt it the last few weeks. I have a friend who's actually given me a stretching plan, so I'm, I'm at that point in my life where I will actually reach out to people. <laughs> I just want to make it to the scene. Um, but come watch if you want to. It's a pleasant view park there. Um, Wednesday, I think everything is normal. Is there anything else you know of? I don't, I don't know either. I was out on Thursday at a conference, so I don't know. Yeah. Take, tell them, because I wasn't here when you made the first announcement. Tell them. Yeah. <laughs> Bills of Faith is a huge FCA thing. It's across the country. It's not always the same week. Everywhere I think some schools do it this next week, but there's yeah, it's a huge thing, uh, bringing lots of people together, um, worship and speaking and food and all that kind of stuff. So basically, Russell's Russell's doing it and they're trying to get some help with donations for food and all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in, and you feel compelled to be a part of helping with that, see Madison over there or Erica, maybe Erica. She loves attention all over her. Um, <laughs> If you want to help with that, um, Dana's not in here, is she? I don't think so. Do you want to know anything else? Okay. <laughs> we'll call it good then. Uh, the, the closing scripture this morning, the benediction comes from Revelation 7, verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. 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 Amen.